I'll do that. <laughs> oh, I tell you. Um, I love to eat. It's obvious, you can see that. But uh, they have fed me well this week. And uh, so I appreciate that. We went to Sister Vicky's and Brother Casey's tonight, and <clears throat> she had some of the most beautiful, most beautiful biscuits I've ever seen in my life. And uh, those things were about so big, and they were just about so thick, gold and brown. And I had made up my mind last week that I was going to stop eating bread. And uh, But the devil got behind me and pushed me. <laughs> uh, there's the devil again, yeah. And I already said you can't blame him, can you? <laughs> but... <laughs> I have a friend of mine, and he likes his biscuits snow white. Uh, I said, you might as well eat raw dough, you know. And so, so I'm always teasing. So I sent him a picture of uh, Sister Vicky's biscuits, and I said, we're at the marriage supper of the lamb. And he texted me back, and he said, they look like rocks. I've been putting in flower beds today. and uh, But they were, they were excellent. Amen. And uh, I, I love them. Brother Dan Patrick, a friend of mine who pastored for uh, 30 years nearly at uh, Faith Church in Goldsboro, he said the way he wanted to die was a cat head biscuit in each hand and drowned it in a bowl of gravy. (laughs) (laughs) I bet just about agree with him there. But uh, it's hard to preach uh, when you've eaten as much as I did tonight. And uh, I, 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 I... I might as well be honest with you. I just don't like skinny people. I just. <laughs> and so you can't trust a skinny cook, that's for sure. But uh, but Brother Bruce, he always challenges me. And when I'm around, and he eats healthy and works out, and you know, and and smart and all that. And uh, and it, it worried me for a while until I got to check in my records, and I buried just as many skinny people as I had fat people. So. <laughs> It don't help. You're going to die anyway one day. And, uh, and it'll just take more people to carry my body to the grave than it does he is. No, I appreciate those folks who have that kind of discipline. And I, I was talking to somebody the other day. They said, we're in, I'm in a 36. I just said, my last diaper was a 36. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but open your Bibles tonight. Oh, it's Brother... Uh, Tommy said earlier in the week, it's not trying to figure out what to preach, it's trying to figure out not what not what to preach or what not to preach. Uh, and uh, who's that on the back? we got a policeman with us tonight. <laughs> I, should, I feel safe, don't y'all? Amen. I was driving through Jacksonville, brother, I got all the way down to Bay Street. My GPS sent me the wrong way. So I'm coming out of there and I said, you know, it would be something if I got stopped by a policeman. You know, I'm speaking, trying to get to Brother Tommy's house, I confess. <laughs> but uh, I said, it would be something if I got stopped. But I know you wouldn't have given me a ticket. You would have just... <laughs> anyway. Open your Bibles to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Um, I... Got two more messages after the night, and um, most of what I thought I was going to preach, I haven't gotten to yet. And um, but this is a wonderful passage of scripture, and um, I preached on this uh, passage of scripture the first time in the Republic of Moldova, Eastern European country, former one of the formerly one of the Soviet Union states. And uh, we've done quite a bit of work in Republic of Moldova. And I was there preaching in a church that had purchased a building that was run down in the city. It was it had never been finished. And they pur- purchased this building. It was a large building, but they only had cleaned up, able to clean up one room. The room was about half the size of this section here. And uh, they started having services there with the intent to continue on uh, developing the building. And they have developed the building since then and fairly good sized church. At that time we had probably about the number of people we have here tonight. It was a gravel floor, actually bursted concrete. 
They have not put the concrete down yet, more of it. They have just busted up some of the old. And, um, and so it was a rough place. They uh, had no uh, heat system in it. Uh, it still was cool weather. And, uh, but I got there on a Sunday morning. People were excited. And, uh, and so in that service was a young man whose brother I, had, uh, I knew, and his brother was a Christian, and uh, his brother married one of the young girls that I took from Southeastern Bible College to the field to be a school teacher there, and, uh, and so uh, as a missionary, and so I did not know his brother. I had met him, but I did not know him, would not have recognized him if he had not told me, reminded me who he was again. And so when I got through preaching this sermon, uh, he received Christ as his personal Savior. Amen. And now he's working for Tabernacle Church in Kinston as a missionary there in the Republic of Moldova and serving with his brother who operates the soup kitchen mm. and pastors a church there the in one of those cities now. And that's been... Uh, probably that was in the year 2000, so we're looking at 21, 22 years ago. Amen. I preached from this text in that meeting, and to my knowledge, I had not preached on this text again until I was back in Moldova in March of 2020. And I preached from that text in the church in Kosba, uh, Moldova, on that Sunday night. And God honored the message again on that Sunday night. And I hope you'll honor it tonight. One of the things about this text is that it finds a woman in a bad, compromised position. She's immoral, as we'll see. Uh, and Jesus deals with her and also deals with the hypocritical crowd, the pharisaical crowd yes. as well. I usually preach from John 4 and John 8 uh, in this text, but I'm not going to use John 4 tonight. Uh, I'm just going to remind us what happened in John 4. In John chapter 4, Jesus was weary from his journey and stopped by the well and, uh, as he passed through Samaria. And there a woman met him at the well, who was a Samaritan woman, and... Uh, Jesus asked her for a drink of water and she was curious as to why a Jew would have any dealings with the Samaritans. They were very prejudiced once against another. Uh, the Jews hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans hated the Jews. Have nothing to do with one another. And uh, Jesus said to her, well, if you knew who it was that was speaking of thee, you would ask of me and I would have given you living water. Amen. And she said, well, how would you get this water uh, our father Jacob gave us this well and uh, and you have nothing to draw from and how would you get this water? And and he said, well, I'd give you living water. It'd be a well springing up inside of you. An artesian well uh, is what he was illustrating. And uh, it would be something that would be constantly flowing and literally what it would be would be giving you life instead of what you now have. So she said, well, give me this water that I come not here and draw and Jesus said, well, go get your husband. And uh, she said, I don't have a husband. And he said, well, you told the truth. You've had five husbands. And the man you're now living with is not your husband. Now, I brought that up because these two cases reveal to us a very wicked, immoral two women. One uh, had already given up on life. She'd given up on morality. She'd tried five marriages. They all failed. If you've been married five times, it wasn't all your mate's fault. Mm, right. So I don't know whose fault it was, but I know this. She'd already given up, and now she is living in adultery. By the way, if you're living with a person that's uh, of the opposite gender and you are cohabiting with them, involved in immorality, you are an adulterer in the eyes of God. And the Bible says no adulterer will have a place in the kingdom right. of heaven. You have to repent of that sin yes. and get it right. 
But she comes out to that well and she's very moral. I think she's probably ashamed of herself. And Jesus deals with her. And I believe she gets gloriously saved. Amen. Not only does she get saved, but she brings some people to Jesus and says, Come see a man that told me all things ever I did. Uh, may I tell you, God has our number tonight. Amen. He knows everything we ever did, and He knows where we are. And then in chapter 8, just four chapters later, we find another woman similar to this woman. Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives and early in the morning and came again into the temple and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act of adultery. Father, help us tonight and help me as I preach to focus on the amazing grace of God and what you want to do for all men everywhere and all women to give them life and to give them to them more abundantly and to cleanse us of all our sins and make us pure and holy in thy sight and in this world we live in. May that one that's furthest away from you tonight be drawn back to you and if they're unsaved they may repent and believe the gospel and be saved and if they're saved they may find a place of genuine rededication in their life tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. This woman, he, the Pharisees brought to Jesus and they brought her to him to test him. Look at verse 5, uh, verse 4. And they said to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act and Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what saith thou? Mm. Now he, they were right. The law of Moses said if you called an adulterer, uh, you were to stone them to death. That's the demand of the law. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, uh, but you would kill both the adulterer and the adulteress. Right. Now I wonder where the adulterer is. The adulteress is mm-hmm. here. They call her in the very act. You know, it's kind of hard to find a woman in the very act of adultery without catching a man at the same time. Right, right. This was a setup. It was a plan. Mm. Uh, the man she was involved with, I'm convinced, was in partnership with the scribes and Pharisees. This was a setup. It was set up to set this woman up so that they could bring her to Jesus and find fault with Jesus. And they said, The law says we're going to stone her. And what do you say? Then Jesus did a very strange thing. And then verse 6 says, This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Mm. And when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast first cast a stone at her. Mm. Uh, they brought her to Jesus and set her in the midst. The Bible says now you've got to get the picture there was a huge crowd of people at that time around Jesus. He got up and he was teaching them and the crowd was assembled around them and they come with this woman and I submit to you without trying to be crude that they did not give her time to properly dress her son. I think they brought her out in as much of a shameful, shameful condition as they possibly could. They caught her in the very act. I think they just drug her out by the hand and forced her to, to go with them. And here she is full of shame and, and embarrassment. And, and she's cast right in the midst of Jesus before this whole crowd. Now I submit to you that a woman called in such a place and brought to such a place would probably be ashamed to the point that she's embarrassed to look up or to look at the people. That's right. Mm. she's ashamed of herself you know no matter what you do with sin you cannot prevent its effect upon your life True. Uh, sin kills and it destroys and one can never be proud of themselves when they know they're disobedient to God mm. one can never be proud of themselves when they're immoral mm. they may seek to justify they may get their plans to justify it 
But I shall meet when they lay their head on the pillow at night. The holy God of heaven reminds them of just how wicked they are. That's right, preacher. Sin is a destructive thing in our life. Mm. Sin destroys us. I don't know where this woman had come from. I don't know what her background was. I don't know how she came to the place that she's willing to submit herself to the immorality and adultery. But I'm going to tell you, in our nation today and in our land today, it's commonplace. Yes, sir. I talked to a man uh, that I knew I hadn't seen in a long time back a few years ago. And I said to him, uh, Johnny, when are you going to get married? And he was writing out a ticket for me. And, and uh, not a... Not a <laughs> he brought out a ticket last Thursday it was a week ago. Driving my Ford box truck on the interstate empty. And I got a hundred and twenty dollar ticket for driving it empty on the interstate. It wasn't I'll tell you about it sometimes. But see, uh, but I said, Johnny, he brought out a ticket to work he had done for me. And I said, when are you going to get married? And he laid his pen down and he said, Preacher, I don't know when I get married. I can't find anybody fit to marry. He said, now, I date a lot of women. And he said, most of the women I date, the first thing they want to do is get drunk and go to bed. And I said, uh, he said, now, I don't mind getting drunk and I don't mind going to bed. He said, but the truth of the matter is, I ain't going to marry a woman like that. Mm. He's a wicked man, and he'll mind living him more. He's not saved. He's not right with God. <coughs> but he don't want a wife like that. Mm. And so, <coughs> I said, well, Johnny, the problem is you're shopping in the wrong store. Amen. If you give your heart and right with the Lord, and you'll get your life in the church, and get in the house of God, God gives you a woman that you need that'll be right for you. Well, I saw him not long ago, and uh, again, that's a few years back, and he had got married, and he got gotten saved, and his life got right with the Lord, and so I Amen. praise God for that. But the point is today, to live immorally is an acceptable factor in the face of man. But he didn't in the face of God. That's good, preacher. Amen. I like what I was to the governor said, Mark Robinson, said in a meeting not long ago, when he was talking about what's written in the school books now, this critical race theory and all that kind of stuff. He said, filth is filth, and it'll always be filth, and it's filth because God said it was filth. Amen. 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 Now, you don't hear that much from a politician, but no. I thank God for it. It's just filth. Amen. It's sinful. You can't make anything out of it the wicked. It's black, it's ugly, it's damnable. It doesn't make any difference whether it's a woman or a man. Immorality is immorality, and God hates immorality, and under the law, they would be stoned to death. Right then and there, on the spot, that was it. Mm. By the way, God doesn't change. God hates adultery just like He always hates. Right, preacher. Amen. God hates fornication just like He always hates. Right. God hates lying just like He always hates lying. Right. Yeah. God hates unfaithfulness just like He always hates unfaithfulness. God has not changed a lick simply because of the grace. In fact, the truth of the matter is, grace requires more than the law. Mm. Because under the law, it says, "Thou shalt not commit adultery." Under grace. God said, Neither shall you look upon a woman. For if thou lookest upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery already with her mm-hmm. in your heart. Right. Grace demands more. The Bible says in the law, Thou shalt not kill. God said, If you hate a man without a cause, you're the same as if you're a murderer. Grace doesn't demand that from us. Grace demands more from us. Mm-hmm. Grace is not a license to set us free so we can sin however degree we want to. Grace gives us the Holy Spirit in the new birth that we might live victoriously Amen. over the sins of this world. Yeah. And when we do sin, when we yield to the flesh, it's sinful before God, but God's offered us if we confess our sins unto Him, He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so I don't know where this Thank you. from. I don't know when she started in her immorality, but I'm telling you it's commonplace. My brother-in-law teaches at the middle school. At the middle school, he teaches. When the girl said to him the other day, she said, last year she said, he said, now, honey, you need to study harder so you can get, get graduate from school and go to college and get you a good job. He got some water. Yeah. I think I'm going to die. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Uh, thank you, brother. Right here, guys. Make sure this calf has never been broken. <laughs> 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 
Dit is geen gewoon een beetje zo, staat mij weg. Dat is wel zo. Dat is wel zo. Dat is wel zo. Maar wel een half dikte, de middel school. En ze zei, hij zei, nou jullie zijn hartstikke in dit je legislatie. Ze zei, oh, ik ga maar laten van de oren. Ze zei, well, I'm 16, I'm gonna have my first baby. En ze zei, then I'm gonna have a baby after that. Yeah, he already got one, thank you, boys. I'll drink it. Alright. <laughs> She said, when I get 16, I'm going to have my first baby, and then when I get 18, I'm going to have another baby, and I'm going to have three babies. By the time I'm 21, I'll be getting a check from the government. She said, I got my life planned out. Oh, wow. Don't need a husband. She said, I got my life planned out. By the way, she can do it. She can do it. He said, in that middle school, he said, I'm telling you, you don't have any kids that I send to the office every day because either they won't pull the britches up and the bottom is showing, or they're so naked there's a girl who have to send them to the school and tell them they either got to go home or they can't stay in school. Mm. That's in middle school. That's in middle school. There's no blush anymore. Right. And by the way, most of the time it's parents who let them go out that way. Yeah, right. Amen. Parents who let them go Man said in our church a few years back, the pastor was saying to him, I was preaching against mixed women. A mixed women means Men and women don't want to go swimming together unless they're husband and wife, especially wearing the tire swimming today. Right. But he said, look, you, you don't need to do that. And he's trying to preach the truth of God and tell us to live right, to live holy, to live clean. And so a man said, I don't see anything wrong. And on Sunday night, he wanted to invite the whole church over to his swimming pool so that they can have a pool party after church. And he's a member of the church. So now he's inviting the young people to his to his home. He's got a daughter. Uh, she's about 17. He's inviting the daughter. And then he's inviting his 17 year old boys over. And they're all going to be in the pool. And the men are going to be in the pool. And the women are going to be in the pool. And they're going to have on the two piece bathing suits and scantily dressed. And he wants you to believe that that's okay. Mm. And he got mad and left the church because the pastor said, We don't have that here. Mm. My pastor said the other day he was preaching, and I think it's his first church. He's a young man, and uh, I'm trying to teach him to preach. I'm trying to teach him not to preach on over evening. He's named by their brother, see. But he said the other morning, he said, How many of you believe it would be all right if I invited one of the men to come up to the pulpit in their underwear? And everybody in church said, Whoa! He said, he said, well, how many of you may be right if I invite one of the ladies to come up here in their underwear? And all of, all of us said, well, hello. He said, well, what's the difference when we go down the beach and have number one in the underwear? Right. 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 Come on, so much of you. Right, amen. Right. I don't know where she came from, but I know one thing. Today we've grown to accept the doctrine for the teaching as if it was come out of Sunday school. Mm -hmm. And that power preacher most of the time people stand up and preach like that. Mm -hmm. We used to, we preach all preachers. Preach Amen, preach But not anymore. That's right. I don't know, one day she was a pure little girl. Mm. One day she was born and she was a precious thing to her mom and daddy, probably. Yeah. And I don't know where she got off track, but I'm going to tell you, listen to me now. If you're going to let your children, or you're going to get, if you're going to do it, and we listen to this world, we're going to all be off track, and we've got a whole society now that's off track. That's right, preach. Because we moved away from God. Right. She moved away from the law. Now she she was probably a Jewish woman because they would have had no they would have had no reason to vote a Gentile woman. Mm -mm. So she was a woman that was raised under the law. She knew the truth of the law. And so here she is now caught in the very act of adultery, and they bring her before Jesus, and there she is with her sin obvious for the whole world. Mm. And they said to Jesus, Now what are you going to do? The law says stone her. And Jesus then did something unusual. He, he said, uh, Can I, can I, can I get, a, get some help here again? I hate to pick up, Come on, Bruce. <laughs> you don't look like a woman, but. Thank you. <laughs> Our preacher was preaching the other night, and he started out out the gate, I mean, wide open. And by the time he got about halfway through the summer, his voice started going away. He got like, ah, he sounded like a girl. I said, I thought you were going to transgender right in the middle of the church. Oh. <laughs> you start off a man, but you can't end up a lot. <laughs> but he said, you ain't right. I ain't praying for you. <laughs> uh, but we ought to have Bruce be there. The woman called an agony with us. Now, I believe she's, I believe she's shamed. Come on, man. Come here with me. My fault, but I'm a, uh, I believe she's saying, 
I don't believe she's looking at the crowd. No. I think she's got her head down yeah. in shame. Yeah. And then the Bible says Jesus didn't know he was face. He stood down on the ground and he wrote something with his fingers in the dirt. And they kept right on while he's down there and they're asking him this question, what are you going to do? And he stood up and he said, well, you live without sin. First, you test the first stone. And then he stood back around and he wrote again. Mm. And the Bible says that they all went away from the least to the greatest. Yeah, that's right. And when he stood back up the second time, there's nobody around but him and her. Then he said to her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Doth no man condemn thee? And she said a strange thing from a daughter's woman. She'd never seen Jesus to we know that. Mm. She didn't know who he was. And she said, No man, Lord. Mm. That's good. Well, how did she know it was Lord? How did she know the word Lord implies it means literally the Christ? No man, Savior, mm. is what she said. Now she's called out of the world. She's ashamed, full of sin and shame. But now all of her accusers are gone. And when Jesus asked her, Does no man condemn thee? And she said, No man, Lord. Mm. And then he said, Neither do I condemn thee. Only God can forgive sin. Amen, preacher. Amen. And the God of heaven, the Savior of the universe, looked at this adulterous woman, called in the very act, and said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now something happened. Mm -hmm. Right, preacher. And she got born again right there in front of all those people with the shame of adultery visible for all to see. Mm. How does she come to know of the Savior? Yeah. Well, the Bible says he wrote on the ground twice. Mm -hmm. Now what did he write? Okay. The Bible doesn't tell. Yeah. But I think I know. Mm. See, they couldn't really see what she could see because they pushed her over to Jesus. She's standing in the midst. <clears throat> They're standing at least at a distance. When he bows down, I think he's bowing at her feet. And he wrote on the ground. The first statement was, You are guilty as charged. And you must die. Mm. You got it. And she's looking at what he wrote. And that is the truth of grace. Oh, amen. Preacher. The law said we're guilty of sin, and grace says you're guilty of sin. Will you listen to me? Grace cannot be grace if there is not law. Mm. Forgiveness means nothing if there isn't a broken law. Mm. Forgiveness means nothing if there hasn't been a crime committed to be forgiven of. That's right, preacher. Oh, the grace of God does not test the law out the window. The grace of God fulfills the law mm. and makes a way that the law's demand for justice can be satisfied. Praise the Lord. Satisfied on Calvary's truth. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. And the message of the gospel is you're guilty as charged by God Almighty and you're a sinner and you're destined for hell without hope. Mm. And that's for all of us. That's right. And that's the message. I was preaching not long ago, uh, I'll be several years ago now, in my church, and I went to visit a man and run the mobile home park and sell the mobile homes. And so I said to him, I want you to come to church. And I knew him, and he said, I'll tell you, I'm not going to church because all you preachers do is put your hellfire and brimstone. Hellfire and brimstone. That's all the hellfire and brimstone. He said, why don't you preach on the love of God once in a while? I said, you want a sermon on the love of God? I said, I'll give you one. I said, close the office door. I'm going to preach you a private sermon right here on the love of God from John 3.16. Mm -hmm. So he got rid of some customers there. 
closed the door and I opened my New Testament, I read John 3.16. For God, I just elaborated on who it was that had mercy and grace and love. For God so loved the world. And I just whacked out on God. And I figured if this was a private sermon, I was going to keep it just as long as I could. So about two hours later, I said, <laughs> but I said, and the love of God. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I talked about that and how God's love generated his desire to send his own son to die on the cross to satisfy the sins of men. And I whacked out, but on the fact that God loved us and sent his son to die for us. And then I said, and he said, for God so loved the world and sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him shall not perish.
Well, she went away from there. The Bible says in chapter 4, when that woman, thank you, Bruce, when that woman, we uh, <laughs> finally got Bruce saved. He didn't get saved last night. He got saved tonight. And uh, he's got to get his gender straightened out. We got to... That woman, woman in John chapter 4, the Bible says she left her water pot and she went into the city and then she said a strange thing. She said, come see a man. She went to the man. Yes, John chapter 4. Yeah. She didn't go back to the women. You know why? Because the women had nothing to do with her. She's a husband. She's a slut. That's what, by the way, that's what the more women used to be called. Yeah. Now they're singing in the choir. Yeah. Yeah. Now right. they're lifted up as heroes and heroines. Yeah, that's right, Richard. You're right. Now it's okay. If you say anything about it, you're a bigot and whatever else they can call it. Yeah. She didn't go back to the women because I submitted to you the man she was living with was not her husband. It was not the only man she was living with. Mm. She went back to the men. Not to the man she was living with, just him. She went back to the men and said, Come see a man that told me all things ever I did is not this the Christ. And the Bible says that the multitude came out and followed her, and then when they heard him, they got saved and said, We got saved not because of what you told us, but because we've heard it with our own self. And many of the Samaritans believed on him because of the testimony of the woman. Now, I don't know if this woman in John chapter 8 did the same thing, but I'm going to tell you when you get born again, when you get right with God, you can't keep it quiet. Amen. I went home that night after I got saved. I didn't know anything about God. I've never been in the house of God but Christ in my life. I was 18 years old. To me, there was sin I could sin and everyone I thought about and everyone I could think about. And I was just wicked to the core. But that night when I went home and laid my head down on the pillow, I knew I was a different man. I knew there was something different in me. And my mom came walking through my bedroom and I said, Mama, tonight I got saved. She had no idea what salvation was. She had no idea what I meant. And she said, all she could say was, Johnny, that's good. Well, I praise God before she died, she met the Lord Amen. and her Savior. And she didn't teach me how to live for Christ. But I'm going to tell you, she told me how to die in Christ because she died of all because of the grace of God that saved her soul just like it saved my soul. And I want to tell you tonight, you're going to have to tell somebody if you get right with God, Amen. you will be able to keep it quiet. Amen. Amen. The first person I ever told about Jesus and tried to get him saved and born again, I was in Auburn Bishop College in Nashville, Tennessee, and I was witnessing to a fellow student, and it was about 10 o'clock at night, and I started witnessing to him, and we got our Bible open, and so about 11 o'clock, I said, uh, it says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. I said, you want to call on him? He said, I do. So he prayed, he said, Lord, I want you to be my Savior. I said, if you die right now, would you go to heaven? He said, I don't think so. So about midnight, I said, look, he said, right here, if you call on the name of the Lord, he shall be saved. Do you want to call on the name of the Lord? He said, I think I do. He prayed and asked the Lord to save him. I said, if you doubt my name, you go to heaven. He said, I don't think so. <laughs> I said, well, this is wrong. This is fact. He said, where well, So at 2 o'clock in the morning, I called my pastor on the phone. And I said, Pastor, I've got a man over here. I'm trying to win to the Lord. And I can't get him straight because I don't know what I'm doing. And, and, and he can't get it. Can I come talk to him? He said, come on. So we got there about 2.30. His wife, they never shut the door. His wife went in and made us a cup of coffee. He had to be in the back room for about two minutes. And he called me and said, John, come in here. I come in here and said, this man got saved at 11 o'clock. Why don't you come back in the room? I didn't know how many of you the Lord. I didn't know how to use the Bible. But I'll tell you, I knew how to lay on Jesus. I knew he done something for me. Amen. Amen. Like the blind man said, I once was robbed, but I once was blind, but now I see. I don't know about all this theology stuff, but I can tell you, I've never made him change my life. Amen. You can be able to keep it quiet. That's right. The reason we keep it quiet is because we're really ashamed of him. And many times, because we don't even know him. Mm. So I said to you, I believe that woman went out and everybody she met. Aren't you the woman that was caught in the act of adultery? Oh, I am. I was Julius charge. But I met the Savior. He's watching all of Amen. He just cleaned the slate. Bless his name. I like that song. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. God is a great forgiver, and He's a great forgetter. And I'm going to tell you, when you get it under the blood, He wipes it all away, and there is no more sin on your record. It's all gone. And what I was yesterday, 
and the devil gets on my shoulders sometimes and reminds me of what I was and I get on his shoulder and remind me what he's going to be. He's going to be in the pit of hell forever and forever. And he offers some beautiful apples and I remind him that I've eaten enough of his apples to know they're all full of worms. You just stay with Jesus. Amen. And he'll change your life. Amen. Amen. That message way back down in 2000. 22 years ago I got through and I said now would you like to do like this woman and come to a place that you're willing to repent and call him Lord and that young man by silly got up out of his pew and he came and he knelt at that old fashioned altar that old broken concrete altar and I knelt with him and prayed with him and he gave his heart to Christ he's married to one of the young girls we have over there her daddy worked for us son She's married to him. They've got three or four children. Mm. They're serving the Lord in the soup kitchen and carrying on some ministry there. And I tell you something, God has a plan for your life. If you'll submit to it, He'll change your life. And He'll do something with yeah. everybody else. Amen. Right. I think she laid her head down on that pillow that night. And for the first time in a long time, she felt clean. Yeah. Mm. I mean, really clean. Isn't it interesting that God said we could test our sins, be faithful just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Mm. Now what way do you carry? Mm. What secret sin that only you know about or you think nobody knows about it but you? But God knows about it. Yes. Where is it that you're coming up short? Why in the world if you as a believer want to come up short? Mm. You're not happy. You're not victorious. You tried everything, but it don't fit. You chase every bubble and every dream there is. Mm. You've added to your portfolio, and you come up in people's opinion, but you're just miserable in your soul. You know why? Because you're running from God. Mm. That's true, preacher. Your sin didn't all at you. And eating away like a cancer. It's gnawing the wrong way. Mm. Your soul. May I tell you, if you don't repent of that sin and get it right, it'll kill you just like cancer. Kill your body. Sin kill your soul. Mm-hmm. It'll destroy your home, destroy your marriage, destroy your morals, destroy your life. If you get earned blood, God will have to all Amen. Life. Amen. He will. Mm-hmm. But if you're not saved, you just need to save. Yes. Come and say, Lord, I'm guilty as charged. Mm. I know I deserve to die. And the only thing I cry out for is mercy and grace. Mm. Will you forgive me, Lord? Now, what are you going to do? Mm. Heavenly Father, our heads are bowed, eyes are closed, Lord, and you brought us to this text tonight so that we could see the glorious grace of God. What a great thing you did for this one woman. And many of us sitting in this room tonight have had similar experiences where you've saved us and brought us out of the deep miry clay and set our feet on the solid rock, cleaned us up and made us fit, Lord, for one another and fit for society and more than that, you made us fit for the kingdom of heaven. Now I pray, Lord, as the piano plays in a moment, that we'd all do the business that we need to do. Lord, I hope we can all say tonight, boy, I'm glad God forgave me and cleansed me. And I just want to testify and praise Him around this altar and just give Him thanks anew for what He's done for me. And Lord, I want to be able to go out and tell somebody else about God's amazing grace. Lord, we'll thank you for it. But for that one who's not right, that one who's not saved, may they come tonight, Lord, and submit to you, to your authority, to who you are, and yield to you and receive you by faith that you might also save them. And we'll thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Now, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you stand with me? Piano's playing tonight. I believe God's been moving in this service tonight. 
He moved the other nights, but I believe tonight's been a little different. I've sensed more of the Spirit of God tonight than either of the services. What is God doing in your heart? Why don't you yield to Him? Why don't you let Him have His way tonight in your own heart? Would you do that? If you're not sure you're safe, Pastor will take the time to make sure that you understand it all so you can know that you're right with God. If you've been saved but you're just wandering and flirting with sin and with the world, why go on? Why go on and destroy your life? Why don't you come and just say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender all. Brother Tommy, lead us in a congregational number and this invitation. Sing along with us. 275. teacher when I really got right with the Lord and answered the call to preach and Will Graves one of the finest Christians I knew at the time. Will was a drunkard and a 
gambler and a womanizer, and but he had a godly father, prayed for him every day. And uh, he begged Will in a revival like this to come to church. And Will said to him, I, I, I can't. And his, he said he had gone to his dad to borrow some money to pay off a gambling debt or he was going to be in trouble. His dad said, I'll tell you what to do. If you'll come to revival just one night with me, if you come tonight, I'll loan you money to pay off the gambling debt. But if you don't, I'm not. So Will was kind of caught. He was back against the wall. But he came that night. Dad had been praying for him. This old drunkard came and he was in a service like this. Bobby Jackson was preaching, the evangelist under whom my wife got saved. And, and he preached that night and he did not know Will. He'd never met Will, didn't know Will's story. But he preached that night and he preached on Just As I Am without one plea and they sang that song. They sang all stanzas of that song and Will said, I just kept pressed. People had come, but I just kept pressed in my spirit that we need to sing some more. So they sung the song through again. All four stanzas. Will said, listen, we just can't go. Somebody, God's dealing with somebody here. And the third time on the fourth stanza, 12 stanzas of that song, Will Gray stepped out of the pew and came to the altar and gave his heart to Christ. Okay, one of the greatest Sunday school teachers I ever sat under and one of the finest Christians I know. He's dead now and with the Lord. He's, uh, he was a pig farmer and, uh, and, and God changed his life. Marvelously changed his life. God knew if he just kept on and kept on and kept on that that water drop of the grace of God would tear through the rock of his hard heart and pierce it. And when it did, Will said, I'm coming just like I am. And he came. Now listen, we're not going to sing 12 stanzas of night unless Tommy, Brother Tommy tells us to. But I want to tell you, God's, God's, God's dealing with somebody's heart in here. Yes, sir. Amen. And uh, he wants all of us to go out clean. He wants yes. us to go out right. And uh, Will followed the Brother Bobby around. He, he held meetings all around. And he went everywhere he was, no matter how far it was uh, in the state, he'd go hear Brother Bobby preach for about two or three months. So the, about the third meeting he came to, Brother Bobby then knew the story and all. And so he said, uh, one night he said, I want Will Graves. He got saved just a month or so ago in one of the meetings at Bethel. I want him to close in prayer tonight. Will never prayed in public. He bowed his head that night and he said, God, you know my heart. Amen. Amen. Oh, glory to God. He knows your heart. And he knows if it's clean and right. And he knows if you've come to him and let him wash it and clean it yeah. all up. Amen. And he also knows if it's spotted. Yeah. He also knows if it's dirty. Mm. Brother Tommy. Mm. Thank you, Brother Tommy. Anyone want to share anything with us before we close? It is difficult to close services like this. Bruce? I'm thankful that God kept coming to me and, and that He came to me when I wasn't looking for Him. Amen. I never would have if it wasn't for Him. I'm thankful for it. Amen. Bruce shares with me that he was attending church, but he was looking for a reason to stop going. He said, I was traveling, you know, I went to church, just going home that night, and he said, God just dealt with me. I had to pull a car over, and he broke my heart, and, and changed Bruce's life. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not just about going to an altar and saying, Jesus, forgive me. That's right. Amen. It is about a, a personal relationship with the God that loves you, the Jesus who died for you and rose again. Amen. Amen. But Henry... I just thank God that I come down to Florida. Mm. Got to eat. Amen, Amen, brother. Because my whole family's down there. Yeah. Mm. Praise God. But I call my mom every day. Amen. Yeah. And she says, what, what are you talking about? Yeah. We talk about the Lord. Amen. Mm. I told her, I said, come on down, get baptized. Yeah. She goes, I've been baptized. I'm just well. You got to be submerged and brought back down to her. And you see, mm -hmm. I said, let's go to the church. I said, I think you do a lot of Catholic church. I told the priest, don't do it that word. <laughs> I said, put you in that word and bring it back out. That means you'll be saved. Mm -hmm. I don't know. All I can do is pray for him. Amen. But that's important. And yes. God, God is speaking to her. I promise you that. He is the only one. And your witness and testimony makes a big difference. <laughs> Amen. I want to give God honor and glory. I want to give Him praise. 
Amen. Sir. Because he's worthy of the glory to be praised, for he reigns forever Amen. and ever, and he'll reign on our hearts. And I thank Jesus for dying on the cross for Amen. us. Amen. I just want to praise his holy name. Amen. I want to glorify him. Yeah.